गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन एंड आई वेलकम यू टू दी सीकॉट स्पेशलिटी ऑर्थोपेडिक रिव्यू कोर्स टू थाउजेंड सेवेंटीन दिस इज द थर्ड टाइम दैट वी आर कंडक्टिंग दिस कोर्स एट सर एच एन रिलायन फाउंडेशन हॉस्पिटल इन मुंबई एंड आई एम प्राउड एंड प्रिवलेज टू हैव सो मेनी सीकॉट मेम्बर्स हेयर विद मी द फर्स्ट टॉक ऑफ दिस की नोट सेशन इज ऑन आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस एंड रोबोटिक्स वॉट डज द फ्यूचर होल्ड फॉर मेडिसिन it's a bit unconventional talks for an orthopedic conference but i'm sure that you will keep hearing these terms artificial intelligence and robotics more and more in coming years and i have i personally have no doubt that it, this is going to become an integral part of orthopedics in coming days i'm bit awkward giving this talk as you can see from my body language and i'll start With this small couplet, जमी पे पाओ है फिर भी आसमान छूने को जी चाहता है हजारों तारों के बीच में एक चांद पाने को जी चाहता है हर पल बदलता रहता है इसका फैसला ना जाने क्या ये दिल चाहता है Meaning that despite being firmly grounded, we still aim for the moon. and amongst hundreds of stars we still aim for that elusive moon and we keep changing our decisions some day we want this and some day this we want this and while i'm giving this talk there are few thoughts that are topmost in my mind and first of them is are we too elitist to talk about artificial intelligence and robotics in today's uh, india when i was preparing this talk a horrible tragedy was unfolding in gorakhpur where a lot of neonates died because of lack of oxygen and here we are talking about technique and technologies and talking about hand welding holding the technology um, whereas we should be holding the real human lives i also feel a bit awkward because i feel that i being an organizer delivering a keynote lecture is a bit unfair it shows that we are self obsessed but you will appreciate that a conference and you are aware that the theme of this conference is technique and technology and a course or a conference on technique and technology in today's day and age without a talk on artificial intelligence and orthopedics would be incomplete i tried contacting many people for this subject of talking about artificial intelligence and auth- and and uh, robotics in medicine unfortunately i couldn't find a single person willing to deliver this talk i'm sure there would be many many people more willing more deserving and of course more talented to deliver this talk unfortunately i couldn't find one so here i am talking about Uh, artificial intelligence and also being despite being an organizer for this case and thirdly and most importantly i know the majority of us here are orthopedic surgeons is the traditionally intelligent orthopedician is considered an oxymoron so if you see this venn diagram you will find that uh, people often chide us for having this god complex and having hammer and wanting to help people at the same time and the orthopedician kind of perfectly fits into all three complexes and so an orthopedician talking about intelligence and that to artificial intelligence would perhaps be called as a striking nonsense our intelligence is limited and our artificial intelligence is even more limited to asking siri whether this is a zebra or an horse pun intended now moving over to something more serious we all know the robots robots is derived from a czech word it's a biosynthetic machine used for a forced labor the earliest reference to these were made in da vinci's sketchbook and this helped set up the stage for innovation in this field officially if you look at the history of ai it was born in 1956 as a as a both science of engineering and medicine and these are some uh, old scriptural references to artificial intelligence isaac asimov um, uh, has this epic book called the Ro- robots of the dawn which kind of 
brought it into the public imaginations and the indian mythology has its own share of so called uh, uh, robots it's believed that kumkarna was a robot uh, so yeah so 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 human human psychology has always been toying with the ideas of how the robots were how they will influence the people how they will uh, destroy the world and so on and so forth one of the most important thing that had happened was the da vinci so da vinci legacy is what we call in artificial intelligence and robotics led to i mean it was in the renaissance that he made a detailed anatomy of he did a detailed study of the human anatomy and designed a humanoid robot at least on the sketchbooks it was in 1495 and rediscovered in 1950s and uh, <clears throat> as per the descriptions the uh, da vinci robot called night robot was able to stand up sit down wave arms move head and jaw and could be operated by pulleys and cables while they by themselves did not kind of <clears throat> progress the science they provided an inspiration for a generation of robotic researchers some of whom worked at nasa now just to give an idea of the limitations and um, um, and how it changes how the ai changes if you look at this diagram how many of you here can solve this problem i'm still counting i've not got even one hands up but if you give this problem to a computer by sheer brute computing force it would solve a million of such problem in a millionth of second now see that's how the brute computational force of computer solves solves this problem which to human brain at this stage seems quite extraordinary going deeper the neural networks so we are all aware of synapses and neurons and dendrites and an artificial neuron or the underbelly of the artificial intelligence is also in kind of sync with our dendritic structure so if you look there are synapses there are axons there are dendrites body bias outputs axon so so the framework of ai is pretty much built on the neuronal structures of a human brain where it has where it has got interconnections and synapses a transmission mode and an output thing going more specific and i'll do this i, I I've just start with the basic things on ai and then we'll just talk about something of ai in medicine and then of course i will focus primarily on how the ai is transforming the orthopedics So when you look at the AI in medicine, it's got two branches: virtual and physical. So virtual is about the computational uh, force that I was talking about. So it's basically uh, represented by a mechanic, a ma- machine learning, also called as deep learning, and that mathematical algorithms improve learning through experience in this virtual uh, component of AI, and the physical component. are the physical objects medical devices and sophisticated robotic arms that actually take part in the delivery of care and in aid in performing the surgeries so so there's a lot of talk about what is ai what is robotics if we look from an outside in general although they are component of ai ai by itself is is the virtual component is the machine learning component and the robotics is the physical component and both of them actually go hand in hand at the same time their evolution is slightly different because um, in robotic lot of automation is involved whereas in the the ai or the virtual learning or the machine learning part lot of algorithms are involved of course they both need help of each other to kind of progress specifically the physical component the robots need lot of inputs from the virtual learning part to kind of perform and if you look at the learning paradigm for these ai algorithms they could be unsupervised they can just go randomly find patterns it could be supervised they can classify and predict algorithms based on previous examples and there could be reinforcement learning use sequence of rewards and punishment to form a strategy for operation in a specific problem space and here at the hn reliance foundation hospital we have we are probably the first in country to start all of our uh, documentation on an ehr format so this is how uh, AI system for medicine would work. So you'll have inputs from diet, lifestyle, genetics, gut microbiome. You'll have some data coming in from social media, omic data, even wearable technologies. 
these days and all, all of this will be collated at the EHR level and then there will be precision medicine platform which can be data shared on a cloud to the researcher and uh, physician but more importantly when it comes to the artificial intelligence and its three component of cognitive commu computing deep learning and machine learning and the learning paradigms of supervised unsupervised or reinforcement learning that an improved patient care would be delivered so this is a very important slide because it tells you what data would come in what all use can be made and how these three things cognitive computing deep learning and machine learning would lead to an improvised patient care so if we work on this template we'll be able to kind of use the big data in a big way now we have a lot of firsts and we'll keep hearing about these first days of success in medicine with ai and first was the of course the protein protein interaction algorithm that many of you might be knowing which led to novel therapeutic target discoveries and uh, it permitted production of over 5000 protein complex of which over 70% were enriched by last one gene ontology function term we have got publications um, and it ranges from coronary syndromes to pulmonary hypertension to neurosurgery so all these sectors virtually have been touched with the ai and of course integrating ehr with ai is is a big challenge and uh, you'll see how different things are being working or different um, um, agencies need to work in close collaboration or a lot of interdisciplinary sharing of thoughts to reach this uh, uh, close coordination between the EHRs and the AIs. This is a video that I've just put to kind of tell you how close how close we are to the um, to, to use of robots in uh, the medicine as well. This is from a car manufacturing plant, Mercedes, of course, um, which shows the degree of automation that has been reached in the car industry. And this is happening in Germany, of course, that a very similar plant is being uh, kind of being set up not very far from here at Telega. In and we see that the majority of work in this car plant is now being overtaken by the uh, robot. So it's, it's not just a warning, it's, it's kind of an insight on how the technology is moving forward. We have seen that the car, the car industry used to be a major chunk of employment provider at uh, one stage of human evolution and, uh, and today we can completely replace uh, these automated machines which used to kind of look like a sci-fi film not many uh, years ago. So at least uh, when I was a kid, I could only imagine this happening in some kind of uh, science fiction movie but this is reality this is this is um, this is closer than what we know and what we think exists coming to more specific surgical robots and these are the classification of surgical uh, robot one is the master slave manipulator where there is a master or the surgeon is typically the master and the robotic arm is the slave and it's manipulator Manu and, and that's how the surgeons um, manipulate the slave. There are automated machines, collaborative robots, handheld robots, and this is a very interesting notes, uh, which is the natural orifice transliminal endoscopic surgical robots. And we'll just glance through each of these because um, the talk primarily is about orthopedics. So this is the classical telemanipulator, one of the most successful surgical robots, whereas wherein a surgeon sits on the console and a robotic arm with its camera is operating on the patient the most uh, useful it has shown uh, the most of its use has been in the urological surgery and the gynecology <coughs> field but now increasingly being used in head and neck cardiothoracic and um, almost all um, oncological surgeries the traditionally it's called as da vinci it's named after da vinci and uh, over 200000 surgeries have been conducted in 2016 it's got four interactive robotic arms three arms that hold objects so scissors scalpel and electrocautery and the fourth one that actually cameras carries a camera with dual lens for stereotactic vision the these are controlled from a console which is operator dependent this is how the arms look like and you can see all the different type of instrument and that's the dual uh, camera that we have and that's the uh, kind of an inside of a 
um, uh, one of the arms of the robot. Now when we look at the evolution of these things, um, aviation to manufacturing and now we are talking about orthopedics, that any industry, um, uh, you know, if we look at the evolution phase, the consideration of industry as an art by experts in field is the first step in the evolution. So people call it, oh look, the surgery and orthopedics are different. Now orthopedics is an art, it's a different speciality. We then go into uh, the second stage of evolution where we develop certain set of rules and instruments specific for doing a task. Uh, in orthopedics and arthroplasty, we have seen that a certain set of rules and implants have come in. The third stage is where we develop standardized protocols and procedures and templates for doing tasks. And I think we are fairly off that stage. So we have kind of crossed these three stages in orthopedics and medicine. The fourth and the fifth are the eventual uh, evolutionary phases and you'll see that that's happened to most manufacturing now where the automation is the buzzword and now with AI, the AI in the computer integration is the next buzzword and that's how our industry would also involve the orthopedics and the medicine wherein we'll go for more and more automation and computer integration. So we'll have less of hard work on the ground and more of hard work behind the scene. So that is where we are headed. We are headed, and I'm I'm very confident that um, the 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 pace of this whole development will be very rapid. And before we blink our eyes, we'll we'll be in this automated orthopedics phase. Now, robots in orthopedics have been available clinically in some form for over two decades. The first one that was used was Robodoc, and it was a joint collaboration between University of California Davis and the IBM Thomas Watson Research Lab in New York. So the development happened between 1986 and to 1992. That's over 25 years now. And um, the, the 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 few first again, the Madison described it for total knee surgeries. Uh, it was a passive system that positioned saw and drill guides with respect to bone geometry. Now, if you look at most system now, there'll be a robotic arm, a robotic cutting jigs, or a milling system. And the navigation strategy, strategies that will be used will be active, semi-active or passive control system. Now there is a difference between the orthopedic robots that uh, uh, from the conventional Da Vinci robot. Well this Da Vinci would take things out, we put things in, so we kind of implant things whereas Da Vinci would be typically used to take the prostate out or for an oncological procedures. So there is a difference. And if you look at the basics, what does these robot do? So they confine or they provide more accuracy. So they would restrict a surgeon, for example, not to burr or saw outside a preset volumetric pattern. So a planned level of resection in three-dimensional is calculated and the robot would restrict a surgeon from doing anything more than that. There will be a haptic sensation mechanism through which an auditory tactile or visual change would kind of warn surgeon or would give an idea of where we are going. And uh, this would, of course, mean that we can carry out a surgery more precisely. And various systems have been in use. So if you look at the systems available, there's been Robodoc, which is uh, made by Think Surgical Fremont CA. Then Casper also stands for Computer Assisted Planning and Robotic. Rio, which is the Robotic Arm Interactive Orso System from Stryker. And the Navio PFS, which is from the Blue Belt Technology Plymouth, and now probably bought by uh, Smith & Nephew. Over time, the autonomy um, and the robotic role has increased from passive to active. So if you look from cyber naive robotoc to Da Vinci and now even more and more thing. Presently in orthopedics, we use semi-active systems, mostly which is the Mako and the Navio. The original were however the active system. So actually we have stepped right from an active to a semi-active system. So Casper and Robodoc were the first generation ones which are the active system, whereas the Mikos, Rio and the Navio, which are popular nowadays, are semi-active systems. So you can see, and they've got different kinds. So Robodoc was an autonomous system which used milling. It was an open platform and uses CT scan images. Mako again is, uh, Mako on the other hand, can be used for unique compartmental total hips, uh, total knees. It's a semi-autonomous system, uses burr, reamer and saw. It's a closed platform for striker system. It uses a CT scan. Navio, which I said uh, has been now taken by the Smith and Nephew, is 
currently approved for uni compartmental but i hear that the coming weeks we'll have its approval for total knee again a semi autonomous or a semi active system uses bar to kind of resect uh, the bone it's an open platform so that means it can be used for any uni or total knee systems does not require a ct scan i block personally i have no experience with i block uh, was being used for total knees a completely autonomous system used a manual saw again closed system and uh, you did not require a pre operative imaging so so the current system as i said are mainly semi active and these require surgical involvement but they by providing feedback which is usually tactile it augments the surgeon's control and thus improves the safety uh, they are of course will have a haptic uh, uh, system uh, or a haptic uh, mode to kind of give feedback and a lot of people would say well, what is different about this from computer navigation so computer navigation have been typically a passive system it will just give you a guidance and feedback but they'll not block you they'll not provide a haptic restraint from overcutting or under resecting or going out of a particular area so the robot is an enhancement of navigation in term that not only it does tell you what to cut or what not to cut it kind of make sure that you do that particular thing so so that is semi active and over the years we will probably have an active where we will will not be actually performing the surgery at all um as i said it's a step back because the original robotoc and casper were an active system but for some reason their success rate could not be um, could not translate into actual benefits and hence the semi active robot system wherein the involvement of surgeons are is equally necessary have come into play now when we look at how we do it there are three steps pre operative preparation operating room settings and technique or execution of the procedure and here i'll talk about blue belt uh, navio which i am familiar with it's an image free system so that means no ct scan is required it takes uh, all the data intraoperatively by registration or mapping and causes planning it does an intraoperative gap balancing it's a semi autonomous system and again it uses bar which has got two mode a speed control and an exposure control so these are the two mode that is used two main inventories so we've got a pre operative uh, planning workstation and then we have got an arm so if you look at the whole thing just two main hardwares are there which is a working station and the other is the electromechanical arm pre operatively uh, we sometimes require a long leg x ray and if required ct scan for assessment of bone and deformity so the system doesn't mandate taking a ct scan but if you wanted to kind of understand um, the anatomy better you can use that so the referencing is just like conventional navigation and the steps of course are again simple and similar which is the first step is the registration the second is the gap planning third is the prosthesis placement planning then carrying out the resection or burring and finally the validation so this is the uh, workstation and that's the robotic arm so first step as i said is the placement of array um, usually uh, if it's a uni compartmental uh, replacement you can place the array very close to the uh, medial femoral condyle so you can see the placement and that's the registration happening so so uh, so the registration device is pretty similar to the com conventional navigation you do the femoral uh, registration by rotating the center of hip uh, in various direction to kind of uh, pinpoint the center of hip you um, map the uh, femur and tibia and then you can plan <coughs> your gaps and processes placement this is typically the bar it kind of moves in and out of this whole thing and uh, you can see how it burrs so if you look at this uh, pink area that's the area that suppo is supposed to be burred the yellow is that you have reached a level which is not adequate but you have burred that area and the green stands for the area that has been burred enough so uh, suppose burring this is how with the pegs uh, the femoral bone looks like so so on the left hand of your screen that's the typical uh, burring process whereas on the right side you see the tibial on the top and then you see a prepared femur and i'll run a small short video of uh, showing how it actually happens so this is the company video uh, by blue belt technology you can see the femur is being registered 
the gap being balanced now. And these are this is the handled robot. You can see that the bar is uh, coming in and out, and all those trackers are there. So it is burying the bone now. It is similar to the other video you can see actually. The burying process is happening. You can see that I am just holding this wire and uh, the whole thing was kind of uh, a haptic, providing a haptic sensation by the sound and this whole thing. It's been used in spine, so again uh, it's called as Medor Spine Assist, uh, different attachment point on each mount, three different drill guide lengths and two extension bridges and of course the software can be used in conjunction with the plan and inform the surgeon about which position drill guide and if any extension bridge will be needed to place the implant. So the spine people have also started using it very, um, I'll not call it very frequently but you know, yes we can see things happening in the spine arena as well. Uh, outcome studies have started coming in which is a good uh, thing that means that people are using it and validating their outcomes with use of these devices and and so far it doesn't look too bad okay. now um, <clears throat> this is the buzzword for whom the bell tolls now uh, um, people are scared of the technology people that's happened when the computer came in where uh, People believe the computers will take away the jobs um, and now the next thing is um, the AI. So everyone is worried that artificial intelligence will kind of steal away the jobs and probably will be redundant as a human race. So um, I can only tell that I don't know. I don't know the answer whether it will be good, bad or ugly with the AI and robotics coming in. I can only tell that it's imminent. But there are some insights on what will happen to certain things. So this is an example where um, where the uh, the computer defeated the 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 chess master, okay. And uh, and um, so if you look at the games like uh, chess, Jeopardy, and Joker, of course the computer has shown that it can defeat humans. So as I said, anywhere where the sheer computing force is required, computers are definitely going to take over. And they will be much, much better than what any human can ever think or do in terms of um, performing uh, on a computational power. So all these things where, uh, where a lot of moves are involved, where a lot of thinking is involved, uh, the computers will take over. But you will not see it in the field where, 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 where more skillful things are required. For example, golf. No one talks about robots in golf. So if you look at the real story, um, the robots fall over opening doors, um, their intelligence is less than 6th grade. They, for example, they kind of commit stupid mistakes. So for yellow and black stripes can be mistaken for a school bus. And in life, life is very complex. Um, the other side of philosophy says that there are vision, illusion, confusion and, and rarely conclusion. That's what makes us human. That's current state of human civilization that there are no fixed answers for things and the true sign of intelligence is not knowledge but imagination and robots do not have an imagination so i think human will have some role it will uh, it will uh, uh, ensure that some things are being taken away from the human beings but as long as we are creative as long as we are imaginative i don't think the robots will take over the entire human civilization as a surgeon we have got uh, uh, different stages of our uh, uh, our career we start from general knowledge acquire some basic skill we start with assisting then become a training surgeon we receive our board certification we practice and then we have a mastery so the debate between a born surgeon and cultivated surgeon 
is I think somewhat outdated. I think we will be increasingly leveraging technology and techniques to reinforce our skills and they will become an important part of our armamentarium to perform complex surgical procedures. When you look at the road ahead, it's unclear. We have got two of the top mo topmost mind in the field of technology clashing over the future of AI. People predict doomsday scenario, people can accuse other of having a limited understanding and good enough that we have started uh, having an editorial uh, discussing the rise of artificial intelligence and uncertain future of physicians. So yeah, so there's a lot of uncertainty around but in a nutshell I can only tell that no industry which has seen robotics being introduced has not seen an increase in production capacity, improved accuracy and precision along with lower cost. So now that robots are being introduced in medicine, I'm sure that these things will happen, that eventually it will be used more and more to improve our operating capabilities, improving our accuracy, our precision and decreasing cost. There are periods of development and refinement before the adoption happen and which is again where we are in today. Um, for me, being an orthoplasty surgeon, I think it is definitely going to lead to a viable improvement over uh, time and that these failed technologies will provide will prove to be a stepping stone uh, for uh, very exciting future development. This talk was titled what does the future hold and as I said I don't know what the future holds but I do know who holds the future and and the answer to that is us. I think the best way to predict the future is to create it. I think all of us sitting here as an orthopedic surgeon, as a member of CCOT, as a member of Reliance family, have capabilities, have vision, have desire to create something which is long lasting. I think this is one arena which requires a lot of work, has got a lot of scope, it's got a lot of imagination, a lot of things that we can contribute to the society. And I think it is for us to create the future that we want. Thank you very much and once again um, I welcome you again to this evening of CCOT keynote lecture session which will be followed uh, by the dinner. Uh, um, as a host I would also like to introduce my next speaker Dr. Clement Joseph who is going to talk about a very interesting topic on the regenerative medicine. So you look that we talked about the artificial intelligence now we have got someone who is pioneer in the field of regenerative medicine talking about where the other future holds on the regenerative medicine. And then we have got a professor from IIT who is going to tell about the implants and the bioimplants. And finally, the most important, the human aspect, the fourth lecture on this today's night is um, about teamwork. So I think unless the teamwork complements the technique and technology, nothing can move ahead. So we've got very interesting lineup of lectures after this. So kindly stay on and followed by all these lectures is an equally uh, interesting dinner which our chefs at Reliance have cooked up using the technology. So you'll have uh, some some unique things. I'll not disclose the secret, but I'll just glimpse give you a glimpse on what you can expect. You'll have beetroot blood shots in uh, test tubes, uh, you'll have smoking things coming out, so it's molecular gastrognomics and technique and technology in food industry that will be at display. So stay back and enjoy the evening. Thank you very much. May I invite Dr. Clement Joseph to take the stage.